Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jeff, and today I'm going to tell you the difference between a $3,000 bike and a $9,000 bike. And in case you're wondering, I'm not going to continue with this awful accident for the whole video. A question I've been asked a ton in my life and we get all the time at the shop is kind of just what really is the difference between something like a $3,000 bike and a $9,000 bike? Um, people who are buying bikes ask that question and people who are just total novices and don't ride bikes always ask that question. So we wanted to really break that down for you guys and not only just talk about the very specific differences in components and quality and obviously big factors like weight are going to play into here, um, but also how does it actually translate onto the trail? When you're riding this thing on the trail, what's actually different about it? How does it feel? So check below in the video description for all of the actual text and data of these two things compared, but we're going to talk about the details today, show the things on the trail, and show my differences and the differences that people feel. And we've got Zach, Jared, <laughs> and our final test candidate, Bo. So let's go for it. So the two bikes we're using for this test are a DaVinci Troy NX, the retail on this thing is about $3,200, and a DaVinci Troy X01, the retail on this thing is close to $9,000. Um, as many of you probably already know, one of the biggest differences is weight. So this bike is just about four pounds lighter than this bike. So as you spend more money on a mountain bike, or pretty much any bike, they do tend to get lighter. Um, that has changed a little bit over the years. The biggest thing over the years that's happened for bikes in this, you know, we'll call it $2,500 to $4,000 thousand dollar price point they've gotten a lot better just more value for what you're paying um, sure you've seen some you know good upgrades and stuff on the higher end as well but the uh, lower price point has really sort of caught up in terms of quality and weight and everything else and these bikes haven't really gotten any lighter over the years they've just gotten a little bit more durable and a little bit fancier here and there um, so I think to me Two of the main differences that you're gonna notice on a bike that is you know, $3,000 to $9,000 is a couple things, weight and details. And um, details are what we're gonna dive into today. So these are tiny little things that me as a longtime mountain biker and total bike snob really notice and really kind of give me a pet peeve. And uh, I do think I'm a bike snob, but we'll see if other people think I'm a bike snob. Yes. The biggest. Yes. Yes. Weight weenie, as they call it. Depends. Mountain bikes, yes. Gravel bike, could have a nicer one. 100% bike snob, that's all. So you might wonder if you're gonna notice these differences or maybe you already know that you do. So uh, the first thing I mentioned was weight. So this, almost everything on here is aluminum. So frame, cranks, rims, handlebars. Um, and over here, a ton of stuff is carbon. The frame is carbon, the rims are carbon, the handlebars are carbon. And there is pretty much what makes up your weight. Amongst other things, that thing is cranks as well. Um, suspension's fairly similar on both these bikes. And although we're testing these two bikes, this whole analysis is very likely applicable to pretty much all of these bikes when you're comparing, you know, that $3,000 price point versus that $9,000 price point. So that's what we really wanted to dive into. And um, again, getting other people's opinions that aren't just total bike snobs uh, like myself, but I think something for me is since I'm so used to riding bikes at this price point, I really do notice the like tiny little details and stuff um, when I hop over to one of these. I've been riding both of these extensively to get a really good review on both of them and to let you guys notice the little finite details that I notice on these things as well as some of the other guys. All right, well, we are back in the shop. We all spent some time riding these things. And before I dive into my detailed analysis, let's see what the three riders thought of these things real quick. Zach, you rode both bikes, the $9,000 carbon racer and the aluminum one, just over three grand. What were your thoughts? Both are great bikes. Um, the biggest thing was 
the engagement on this rear hub wasn't as good as this $9,000 bike, as well as the shifting. It just wasn't as crisp and smooth as, um, say, the XL1. Yeah. Um, second thing is, it's, it's heavy. Yeah. Um, so it just wasn't as fast on the trail. Um, and the suspension, the plushness of the suspension on the $9,000 bike and the dampening, it's just so much better. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Poppiness, playfulness, weight played a factor in that too. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. All right. Cool. That's all. So, Jared, what did you think between the two bikes? And I know kind of what Zach just said. The second I handed you the blue bike, the first thing I saw you do was go to pedal and go ding and go, oh, damn, the engagement. <laughs> pretty much. Exactly. Yeah. Zach pretty much took everything I was going to say. Um, engagement on the hub, first thing I would probably address on this bike because, I mean, instant engagement is hard to beat. Um, Dropper lever, also something I'd probably upgrade on this bike. For sure. You know, dampening also, you know, you could probably put a better damper in there and it would probably perform a lot better. But aside from that, um, sweet wheel set would probably be a good upgrade for the blue bike. And yeah, I can't really complain. The Geo feels good on both bikes, obviously. Um, super playful on this bike. But yeah, the weight kind of keeps this one a little closer to the ground. But aside from that, both pretty great bikes. Are they both still fun? Yeah, absolutely. Both yeah. great bikes. <laughs> Especially if you're into more bigger terrain and like, bike park type stuff or enduro type stuff like an entry level bike like this like yeah it would be great totally cool yeah. there you have it do you like 27.5 inch wheels or 29 inch wheels 29 Ooh, why because it's the best <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. okay Bo. You're one of the best mountain bikers I've ever seen. Which bike did you like best, the blue one or the red one? Blue one. Why? Because I looked cool. Ooh, did it ride nice? Yeah. What's your favorite bike in the world? The blue one. Oh. Okay, great. That's all. Thanks. Well, as you can tell, uh, kind of the general consensus here is what I was trying to say earlier, the weight and the details. And again, weight does make a pretty big difference in a bike. Um, this bike being four pounds heavier, it's one of those things that if you're used to riding higher end bikes, you hop on one that's four pounds heavier and you can pretty much immediately tell. Um, and if you just ride them back to back, you can really notice the difference. The thing about bikes though, is once you get used to riding one, you kind of just forget what another one feels like. So I actually spent a lot of rides on this thing and I didn't ride any other bikes in between. And I kind of just forgot that it was heavy. I just rode it and it seemed normal. Um, probably I did like six rides on that thing like that and then I hopped over and rode this again and I was like ooh, mind blown um, way lighter and just felt different and a lot of that comes down to so the weight in that bike is a lot of it's in the frame about two pounds is in the frame so you have a carbon frame versus an aluminum frame the other big thing is the wheels um, so this is just lighter hubs lighter spokes carbon rims versus aluminum rims the next thing where your weight is is in your drivetrain so carbon cranks aluminum cranks and then cassettes um, some of the less expensive cassettes um, they still shift beautifully but they're just made out of different materials and um, sort of assembled differently from the factory so they're just heavier um, so that's where all the weight is those three components so if this is your price point right now, around $3,000, your best upgrades to shave weight are going to be um, your wheels and your drivetrain components. And then eventually, if you want to throw down and get a carbon frame, there you go. Uh, something I did a lot when I was younger and I uh, didn't own a bike shop and, and didn't have the resources is I was buying bikes at this price point and I would just slowly upgrade them and get nicer and nicer stuff. And you know, we have a ton of people that do that and that's super common. So um, weight's a big thing because it does play a role in how that bike feels. Um, details, let's dive into some of those. And these are the little things that um, I really notice as sort of a bike snob, I think most people would probably notice, especially if you rode them back to back. If you've never ridden a bike like this, maybe you wouldn't notice, but if anyone hopped on both these things back to back, they're gonna definitely notice weight and they're definitely gonna notice some of these details. So to talk about that, hub engagement. Hub engagement's huge. So lower end bikes, um, 
are not gonna have as much engagement in the hub. What that basically means is how many ratchet points there is in that 360 degree around the hub. So what that translates to on the trail is the dead space before your pedal engages. It's right here. So that dead zone before this actually engages the rear wheel, um, that's gonna be determined by the engagement. And there's a huge difference. I think this one's about uh, 28 engagement points and this one's about 120, so it's wildly different. Whereas the engagement on this, once it gets about above 80 points of engagement, it basically feels infinite. So there's no dead zone at all and it just immediately engages. Um, it does make the hub a little bit louder, but you notice it right away. When you get used to riding with a lot of hub engagement and you hop on a bike that doesn't, you just feel like, whoa, it's like dead zone before it engages. So um, something super important and a good difference to notice between these two bikes. Um, other than that, little details, the dropper lever and just the controls in general. So the SRAM NX stuff, because it is sort of on the um, entry part of the spectrum for SRAM drivetrains, doesn't have what they call matchmaker compatible. And that means you can't really dial in the positioning as well because the shifter is not connected to the brake lever. Um, and that is just doesn't allow you to sort of get it in the perfect position. So like the shifter is too far over and there's not really any way to adjust it unless you move the whole shifter on the other side of the lever. And then it's too close to your hand. So like you just can't dial in the controls as well. When you can't dial in the controls as well, it just doesn't quite feel as good. Um, Speaking of controls, same thing with dropper lever. Um, you know, bikes in the three to five thousand dollar price point are probably going to have more of like what you'd call a generic dropper lever, um, like this Da Vinci has, and it just isn't as ergonomic. It kind of catches on the bottom of the brake lever. Um, there's no way to sort of connect it to like that matchmaker style to the brake lever. Um, so again, you can't really dial in the positioning of the controls as well. And yes, these are tiny details, I know, but they're still important because we're trying to compare these things and I'm thinking of everything. Um, still on the controls, the brakes are pretty different, right? So these are SRAM Guide T's versus SRAM Guide RSC's. Um, the Guide T's are obviously a bit heavier, but they just feel a bit spongier. They're still very powerful, great brakes, but they just don't have quite the precise modulation of the RSC's. And they also lack um, a couple important adjustment factors. One of them, tool-free reach adjust. So reach adjust is where that lever's stationary position is. The Guide T's still do have a reach adjust, but you do need an Allen wrench to mess with it, and it makes it a little, like, just kind of annoying to, you know, dial in, and you gotta have a tool, right? Whereas, the Guide RSC's, you have a tool free, meaning you can just do this out on the trail if you want. It's really simple, you just literally twist a knob. The other big thing for brakes, contact point. So contact point is that dead, dead zone and lever, how far that lever pulls until it engages. So the higher end SRAM brakes has a contact point adjustment right here. You don't need tool, you just roll a little wheel and you can totally dial in the brakes. The reach adjust with no tool, the contact point with no tool. Um, those two little adjustments can really help you fine tune exactly how you want those brakes to feel. Does everyone care about that? Probably not. Um, if you're in the mountain bike world for a while, you'll come to know and love those little adjustments and really enjoy them. So those are definitely some important details that do matter there. Um, Drivetrain wise, once you're at you know the $3,000 price point bike, they're gonna shift great. The difference is, and kind of what Zach and Jared said, and we made a video once all kind of comparing the different Eagle drivetrains, is that the feeling is different, right? So it still shifts, it does what it, you tell it to, but it doesn't quite feel as crisp or, or just tight and snappy. It kind of just feels like there's a little more flex in the shift lever and a little more just flex in everything in general. So that's a little bit more of like a qualitative thing. It's kind of hard to like pinpoint how that feels, but I think most people, if you rode these things back to back, you would notice that. So hub engagement, little tiny details, um, like in the controls and the dropper lever, how the drivetrain actually feels really matter. The adjustment on the suspension is pretty important too. So you're gonna get a lot more adjustment and better dampers on the higher end bike as opposed to that bike. Um, is that the end of the world? That's probably the least noticeable one. If you're not a bike snob and a suspension snob, you're very unlikely to notice the difference between a suspension on a $9,000 bike and a $3,000 bike. They feel pretty similar. You are gonna miss some adjustments. Those adjustments are really not that widely used or very common, um, but if you're riding them back to back um, and you're sort of really dialed into how your suspension feels, you will notice that and it is meaningful there. Um, so I think those are the things that sort of sum up the differences between these bikes. Keep in mind, these do have the exact same geometry and suspension platform, so that helps kind of isolate that variable out of this whole thing. And again, I want this to be applicable 
to pretty much all bikes when you're comparing that price point of around $3,000 to around $8,000, around $9,000. Those are some of the key differences that you're gonna notice. Uh, again, really does boil back down to weight and details. And uh, if that matters to you, then yeah, you know, save up, go for the nicer one. The cool thing about mountain bikes and something that our business does a lot is just upgrade bikes all the time. So a lot of people come into a bike like this um, and then just slowly upgrade stuff. Toss a new wheel set on there, a new crank set on there, some carbon bars on there, a new dropper, blah, blah, blah. Uh, very common, super usual thing. So let us know down in the comments what you guys think of this topic. Make sure to hit the link below in the video description so you can see sort of, you know, side by side the weight differences of every single component of these bikes and all sort of the written analysis. Hit that subscribe button. We'll see you in the next one.